Go, Wendy. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Methodist Church of New Zealand webinar series for property and health and safety. This uh, webinar is, is about legal conveyancing when buying and selling church properties and risk management. The, we're <coughs> recording the webinar and this will be available in a couple of days on the website with any of that, uh, relevant information. Just a bit of a background on myself and Trudy Downs. I'm Wendy Anderson and I've been managing uh, the property and insurance for the church for over six years. And um, I have a background in insurance and um, investigative work. Trudy is the wellness, safety and risk advisor for the Methodist Church in New Zealand. And she's been with the Methodist Church since 2017. She has a background in risk management and a, a, with a government department and a, and a small business in, in the Christchurch home repairs following the Christchurch earthquakes. If you have a look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see we've circled the QA button um, at, at the bottom of the screen. As, so post your questions as you think of them and um, that they will be answered when, as each speaker finishes speaking. Now legal conveyancing, what is it? That's the conveyancing, conveyancing is the legal transfer of a property from one owner to the other. Uh, the process involves a conveyancing solicitor or licensed conveyancer who acts on behalf of the buyer to ensure their client receives the title deeds to the property and the land it sits on. So everything they're entitled to in so far as purchasing the property. Um, and we've, there's also uh, on this slide, there is um, <coughs> a title uh, document and uh, this is a freehold property and, and <coughs> the land district of Wellington. And all the important information pertaining to the property is included on this uh, document. And that might also include um, a document reference such as a mortgage over the property or an easement with the council. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's the interests uh, are, are listed in that, in that category. So we look at selling, selling properties. Oh, um, and one, one other thing I will say about the title is that generally for the Methodist Church in New Zealand, the title is held as it sits with the Board of Administration. So we're selling church property. What do you need for the approval process? The most important thing you need to know is how much, how much the market um, a valuation of the property is. So a registered valuation would value or carry out a market valuation, not a real estate agent carrying out an appraisal on the property or a rateable valuation. So it needs to be a market valuation and that gives us a good indicator of the value of that property. Uh, you also need a builder's report and the builder's report or the builder's report will include any issues with the property, um, the that the property is robust, if there's any moisture increase, um, you know, that's, that's a, a, re, a reason of, or a very important thing to know. Leaky homes are not uh, cheap to fix. And generally, if you if you have a, um, a, a, an issue with cleaning, for example, and the property's uh, leaking, you've probably got issues with the framing. And also when you have to reclear that, prop, that, that, that building, then, um, you're going to have to bring it up to compliance. So you might find that you're not just going to reclear it, you're going to actually change the cavity, which is the, um, the, or the cavity between the cladding and the, and the um, inside uh, lining on the inside walls. And um, that can be an a even more expensive process. So the builder's report will, will uh, um, report on the, on, the, on the building and just what, how that is, is um, that point out any issues. You also have to provide a land story. And the reason for this is because the uh, Methodist Church of New Zealand embraces the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, and, <coughs> and therefore, if there is any confiscated land or, or land issues with, with um, co confiscation, uh, then that needs to be reported in the land story and that needs to be considered 
by MCPC as to what may need to happen. Now, they were, if they are working in conjunction with Te Taha Māori Property Trust um, uh, regarding any confiscated land, and what sort of compensation will need to be paid from the sale of the property, process from sale of the property. Now, we need to know that the church came into, uh, into that property fairly. Uh, the, so the approval process, uh, we have the parish, <coughs> parish approving the, the sale of the property, and that may be the congregation or it may be the parish council. Then um, synod are involved and they need to approve the sale because they may have a strategic plan for the region and um, they may have other ideas about what that church could be used for. And then of course it goes to MCPC approvals and they will want to see the parish strategy as to why they're selling up. They need to know why and what's their vision for the future. Um, that's probably more in buying properties perhaps than selling and, um, and big construction projects. The Board of Administration has asked that all conveyancing work is carried out by the church lawyer. Our church lawyer is um, Hathalie Lochnan, based in, in Christchurch, and that is in response to the anti-money laundering uh, requirements. Each board member has to have a certified, uh, the identification certified, and that um, is certified by a Justice of the Peace. And um, if they have to do that every time there's this property sale, then or a, <coughs> a property purchase, they're going to be at the JP many times a year. Just to give you an indication of, of the amount of property that the, the uh, property that is bought and sold, uh, the week before we closed for Christmas last year, we actually settled on six properties. It needs a, a signature from the board of administration. Do not don't don't sign the sale and purchase agreement. It needs a board signature. So uh, the board signature will be uh, as required. And um, we have four members of board members in Christchurch that we can we can um, ask to, to sign this document. And 15% uh, contribution from the proceeds from the sale uh, go to the de development fund. And uh, unless the property sale is to purchase another property or the board building is going to be replaced and um, that contribution to the development fund is uh, shared by mission resourcing um, or, or ministry so it's 50 50 ministry and property and um, the property development and the property development fund that is where the property development grants uh, come from so but when you're buying properties, it's pretty much the same, the same approval, oh, it is the same approval process. You don't need a builder's report unless you want to provide one. Um, I think if I was buying a property and someone provided me with a building report, I might think, hmm, what's going on? And I definitely want to get my own. Um, market valuation, again, when you're buying a property, you need to know what you what's a fair and reasonable price for the property so far as the market um, is concerned and once again land story so that, that needs to be provided as well. A copy of the land story in, in, in all cases uh, should go to archives and um, also if there's if there is co confiscated land then consultation with Tataha Mary Property Trust. Once again the approval process is the parish, the synod and then the MCPC. Um, church lawyer again is involved and um, and at the Board of Administration signature. So this is the front page of the sale and purchase agreement, and you'll see that the purchase in this um, instance is the Board of Administration in the Methodist Church in New Zealand. So the title will go into the, into the, into the board's name. Um, vendor is registered for GST. No, in this instance, it's no. So the person selling the property isn't registered for GST. If we were selling the property, the answer to that would be yes, because we are GST registered and um, the accountants in the office will determine how, how the GST is handled. So for commercial properties, GST is applied. And um, if you have included GST in the, in the selling price, then um, you're going to be, or the purchase price of, 
to your advantage to, I guess, if you're purchasing, but if you're selling, you can take that GST off the amount that you're going to receive in, in, in your account. Um, if we go down to the conditions on on this, um, oh, actually, first of all, I'll go to that GST. This this is a, a residential property, and it's inclusive of GST, or I'm assuming it's a residential property. It's it's being the board is offering seven hundred thousand dollars, or the the um, parish in this case is offering seven hundred thousand dollars, and um, once this this goes unconditional, they'll pay the ten percent purchase price of seven thousand dollars to the real estate agent into their trust account. The property is going to settle uh, on the 27th of July, or it did settle on the 27th of July 2018. Now there are conditions that are required in that um, when you're when you're purchasing property, and that's 10 working days um, to carry out due diligence. That's working days, so it doesn't include the weekend or public holidays. Um, and if you can get that up to 20, it's even better because the pressure's on. 10 days isn't long. Uh, and if you've got to get a limb, sometimes that can take a, a little bit longer than you'd like. Um, you may not be able to get a builder or a builder report car carried out immediately. So um, in, in this instance, a building report's required, as in all instances with the purchase of property. And um, also, um, they've crossed out the finance condition because they've, they've got the finances, but if you need a loan, then that's where you, you will include the finance condition which is providing the lender the amount you you're wanting for finance in the finance date anything uh, for tenancies of the properties tenants te uh, in this <coughs> tenanted in this case it's vacant possession so it's, it's been rented out and um it's the, the purchaser which is the board want a vacant possession because they want to use it straight away you'll see uh, the final area that's been circled is the initial at the bottom of the page. So all, all uh, pages on the sale and purchase agreement have to be initialed, and uh, with the exception of the, the page that is, has the board member's signature. Um, further terms of sale is where the valuation requirements are included and also the board approval. So, so this, this offer has been submitted prior to MCPC approval. And this is how you can get, get um, allow yourself, uh, yourself some time, especially in, in, the, like, in the area of Auckland where property is snapped up very quickly. Oh, actually, it's in, the same in Christchurch at the moment. It's, oh, it's slowing down. But um, that was the case as well. So 10 working days uh, to, <coughs> to obtain the valuation and also the board of board approval, so MCPC approval in 10 working days. Now, I will um, I will be able to, if it's urgent like this one is, I will be able to distribute that to MCPC by email, and they will, generally they can turn it around in around 48 hours. Um, and they may have some questions that I have to come back and ask, but um, if they have all the information that's required, for an application, they will be able to, to carry out um, the, their due diligence and make a decision as, as to whether or not they approve a property. And um, properties that are in the flood zone may not always get approved. Uh, there's going to be issues with, with insurance in the future with rising sea levels and properties in the flood zones. So they've been, uh, this, this is, uh, not the same document that we've been looking at. That's another page. Uh, this is the signature page. So in this case, the vendor is the, the Board of Administration and um, therefore the author, authorised signatory has signed this, which um, it will, it is a board member. And um, we, but we, our lawyer has only requires one signature. Now, before this is signed, um, if, you, if you're purchasing, I would expect that to go to the church lawyer so he can, uh, he can have a look. But if it isn't, if it is signed, so the offer, because you've still got that 10 days to do your due diligence, 10 working days, then it can go to the lawyer after that. And that's what you pay um, him for is, or her, it is to carry out, um, carry out the, 
due diligence on behalf of the, of the church and check the limb, make sure there aren't there isn't any, there aren't any covenants over the over the property. Um, so send the sale of purchase agreement to me, and I will get it signed. Arranged. Oh, actually, George is getting them signed now. So you can send them to Georgia or myself, um, and also to, um, you'll need to go to the centre to get them to send the application through the MCPC if it hasn't been approved or it's it's been the offer is subject to the, the approval of the board. So if we look at settlement, settlement, there are things that will come out. out you can expect to come out um, out of the, the sale price. Um, and, and, and when you're purchasing as well, for what you're going to have to pay over and above. So the lawyer's fees, generally it's around 2000 for conveyancing fees. Sometimes it's a little less, it, it might be less. Our lawyer doesn't charge like a wounded bull. He's, he's very good and fair. I think um, he's very reasonable. The, and this miscellaneous charges like photocopying, there might be a rates adjustment, um, there might be money coming back or, or, or having to be paid to... to to pay what the, the vendor has paid if you're purchasing. The 15% contribution to the development fund will be uh, will go to the development fund for, for uh, properties that will not uh, are not going to be replaced or there isn't um, a, a very valid reason for, for the money to be, uh, the full, full amount to be paid into the development fund. And it may be that the sale of um, a property is to, to strengthen the building, or um, it, it, that's an example of, of where the 15% contribution to the development, development fund is, um, it is or the, the parish is exempt. You'd have to make an application to MCPC if that's the case, and they will decide if you're going to be exempt. And um, the, the process from sale of property goes into the CBNL fund. Okay. I think that's me, and it is. Have you got any questions? Uh, uh, yeah, there is a, a question about strategic plans. Um, are the strategic plans for the regions published? No. No, I've never... I've, uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of them being published either. But how often are they reviewed or is it more reactionary when you want to buy and sell in the strategies updated? Well, I think when you have a change in strategy, um, when you put you, your direction, your, your parish is going, it is, is changing, it, then you need to revise or review your strategic plan because that's what you're going to work towards, isn't it? That's your, your strategy for, for your future or your vision. And, so the um, the, yep. the parish strategies feed into the synod strategies, don't they? They should definitely, and I think the uh, the, should, the synod and mission resourcing should be involved in both of those because mission resourcing need to be involved with the region and where the ministry is going. You know, but we might be looking at say Papatoi too, for instance. Auckland's growing out that way to the south um, towards Hamilton, and. Um, Pukekohe is, is a, a popular area, even though it's not that close to, to Auckland. Um, but we, it may be decided that actually we need a church in this area because we don't have one. We do, <laughs> but there might be some, but, um, somewhere in, in the growing areas of, of Auckland that, that the, um, the Synod decide that they would actually quite like to put a Methodist church in there. So if any of the parishes want to see the Synod strategy, they should contact their Synod representative? Uh, sorry, regarding the, the Synod strategy? Yeah. Well, yes, they, they should. And I, I think the Synod should be involved in any, any sale and purchase of property, property sales and purchases, because... They, uh, I mean, that's part of their role is that they carry out the, the governance for, of, of churches. They, <laughs> they make a decision as to, to, is it necessary to sell this church? Because it may not be. There might be another congregation, Methodist congregation in, in, nearby that doesn't have a building that needs one. And there's all of those, all of those questions have to be asked. And, and um, 
you know, the thing is, it's a lot easier to sell a church than it is to buy one, buy one or, to, or to, to put a church in a new area or put one back where there was one. Right. And um, if parishes have to use uh, the church lawyer when they're doing the buying and selling, how do they get in contact with the church lawyer or do they contact you? They contact me. Um, generally, I'm, I've been dealing with the property person in the church from um, when they've, they've called me to say, well, oh, what do I do? Um, and to, to get it through the, the MCPC process. So they know that, that they can call me and I can direct them to the church lawyer if I haven't already um, point, uh, given that, them that information and, and perhaps an email or a previous phone call. But generally, we try and go through the whole process so that, that you know there's no surprises and they know what they're up for. And, and so far as um, get, get purchasing property or selling a property. Fabulous, thank you. Those are all the questions that we have at the moment, Wendy. So if anybody wants any further information, it's available on the website under Tangata Property and Insurance. There's a bits and more section where you can um, have a look for yourself. Otherwise, direct any of your questions directly to Wendy. She's more than happy to answer them, or Georgia, her offsider, will assist as well. So we'll move on to risk management now. Um, this diagram is a short version of risk management. It can be carried out um, for almost anything that happens in your parish. So your property team can use it for building hazards. Uh, Many people are familiar with a risk register for building hazards, whether you've got uh, the old puddle outside that needs to be fixed because people might slip on it, or dripping hot water taps, or flooding because the, the sinks get plugged up or something like that. Or youth leaders can use it for youth activities. Parish council can use it for parish activities. But what I'll do is I'll take you through a very simplistic story to explain this diagram. Um, so I apologize for its simplicity, but it's an easy story to tell. It's very understandable. So I'll have a disclaimer for this. The drawing is not to scale, obviously. So the first step in our diagram was to identify the hazard. The hazard in this instance is that there is a brick lying in our footpath and that's the hazard so we're not evaluating the risk just the hazard so when we do come to assess the risk the risk is that we might trip over the hazard and we might fall now um, as i said very simplistic but the hazard is the brick and the risk is the trip or the fall um, Part of the risk assessment also depends on who's involved. So obviously the risk for somebody who's disabled is different from somebody who is able-bodied, uh, which is different again from somebody who might be blind. It also depends on how many people are involved in the activity. So obviously the more people trying to get past the brick, the more that the brick is a high risk hazard. So the, the third option was obviously we need to put some controls in. We need to control the risk. Now, option one is we could minimize the risk that the brick poses by turning the brick around. There's obviously more space either side of the brick. Um, minimizing, as you can see, it still looks pretty daft. Uh, and so therefore minimizing should only be undertaken as a temporary measure until we can eliminate the risk. So eliminating the risk should always be the ultimate goal. And how easy is it to eliminate a brick in the path? You just get rid of it. Um, down the track, the last step is we need to review the control that we put in place. So over time, we just need to check, has the control worked? Or has somebody put our brick back in our path? Um, if the brick comes back on the path, that's where the whole risk management cycle turns into a cycle because then you need to reevaluate um, the, the hazard and start the process back around again. This is an example of the risk register that's available on our website to help your team work through this whole process. You'll need a little bit of knowledge 
about Excel to use this particular risk register. Um, there's some instructions available within the uh, Excel spreadsheet that will help you do things. Um, I will, over time, be putting up a more manual way of managing a risk register like this, if that's what people want. So this particular example that's in the spreadsheet is upside down. The first control that you should always go to should be to the elim elimination control. Um, but if we work through this from our worst control, control to our best control, it's easy to see why uh, some things are just daft. That um, in many previous risk registers that I saw, people would say, well, this is my risk and here's my control. My job's done because I've created a control for it. However, if the control was not good and didn't achieve the same success that elimination might achieve, then you need to go back to the drawing board and have another go. So the benefit of using a risk register that's on Excel is you can have it automated so it color codes. Obviously, if your initial risk is red because it's so dangerous and you can come up with a control that turns it green, then going from red to green is better than going from red to red or red to yellow. So if our hazard is a loose floor hatch in the hallway, then the risk is that somebody might fall through the hatch. And that can be quite dangerous. Um, so our controls, if we start from the worst, is we could put up a sign to warn people. And I'll tell you now, signs are probably the most useless way of telling people about a, a, a risk because they may read it once, but after that, they'll, they'll forget about it. I've read it once, I won't read it again. Or if people are walking down the hallway talking to somebody else or playing on their phone, they're going to miss your sign and they're going to fall into the loose fitting floor hatch. So signs are useless and they don't improve the situation. Now, we could frame the hatch up so that it fits properly and it's no longer loose. What that has done is it's minimised the risk because you don't know if there's going to be a kid going down the hallway with a pogo stick and they're still going to fall straight through the hatch whether it fits properly or not. So again, fixing the hatch is a minimal way of trying to manage the hazard. Um, we could put cones and a handrail around the hatch. Uh, that would be the best uh, version of minimalizing the risk until such stage as you can remove the hatch. Go put the hatch somewhere else and remove it off the floor and that eliminates the hazard. So if you look at the residual risk, so the initial risk is before we do anything about the problem, we put in some controls and then we evaluate how successful we're going to be with controlling the risk and you can see signs are useless, you're still in the red zone, Framing up the hatch properly, well, it's better, but it's not best. So best is always going to be about um, removing the hazard, removing the risk. So examples of how you might identify hazards. Um, somebody could report it. So if you've got a loose floor hatch, somebody might come and say, hey, the floor hatch is loose. So people will report things, therefore that's, that's part of the reason why we have an incident reporting process available. Uh, if your property team carries out regular inspections, they may notice things as well. Uh, there's also the things that everybody already knows, but nobody bothers talking about because we all know it's there. If we know it's there, we should still treat it as a risk or a hazard because when visitors come to our place, they need to know about the risks and hazards as well. So then we go through the process of assessing the risk. We need to make it as safe as we can before we can deal with it properly. We need to tell people about the risk uh, or the hazard that's in place. And then we do our assessment about how big is the risk, how bad is the risk. And then we move on to going how we're going to control the risk. I always recommend that if you can, you use a group think that more heads are, are better than one head for coming up with a solution. 
And ideally, if you get everybody thinking about how can we eliminate this, somebody's going to come up with a clever plan. And then the review process could be carried out again as part of the property team's inspection of, of what's happening around the property. Or if your parish council or your committee have monthly meetings, then they should be going through the risk register just to be saying, have we controlled all of our risks? Have we eliminated them? What are we doing about them? And just follow up to make sure that, that things are happening. Um, and lastly, let me know about the big stuff. Now, part of that is the lessons learned, the lessons that you learn, if I can share those across the connection, then maybe it can stop another parish from going through the same pain. So ideally, we don't want to be repeating the same things across the connection if we can avoid it. So part of the strength of connection is sharing the stories and the lessons that we learn through, through the process. And that's the short story of risk registers and managing risk. Um, we do have a all of church risk register. It won't be much use at parish level because we're looking at a different level of risk than what a parish might come across or what a rohi might, might be looking at. But if your management team needs assistance with, with having a look at larger scale risks in just one location, if you've got many locations, then we are available to help with that also. And we've got no questions that have come in, Wendy. So I think that's us for the evening. Um, thank you everybody for attending. Our next topic will be on Thursday, the 14th of July at five o'clock, not a six o'clock start, five o'clock. And it will be about the church's employment claim process and managing your personal safety at work, particularly if you're a lone worker. Um, all feedback or topic suggestions will be gratefully received. And thank you for your time and interest in attending. Uh, as Wendy mentioned earlier, the recording will be made available shortly on the website, along with all useful references to supporting material. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you.